So here we are in Romans 7. Here we are having learned a decisive deliverance from the power of sin and a dependent responsibility to yield to God. And so a holy life, I'm going to enlarge this just a little. So is a holy life then now bounded by the law? And uh, since the law cannot save, do we now live by law keeping, by some principle of law? Particularly when the universal experience of Christians is that of struggle. Now we find ourselves in the midst of an enormous battle. It seems like it really should have been won. Now it seems to me that Romans 7 is meant to do three major things. It is meant to underscore, undercut reliance on law as a means of transformation. Law keeping cannot save, nor can it transform. And there are a number of questions raised by that statement that Paul wrestles with here. We are no longer under law, but we are under grace. And secondly, it is meant to reflect the universal struggle with sin in both unbelievers and particularly those who are self-righteous and in believers, particularly those who function by legalism. So it reflects the universal struggle with sin. We are all going to say, yeah, that's me. And it is meant to show us, thirdly, the third way. That is neither license, we are free to do anything, nor legalism, our Christian life is bounded by law, but rather the third way, which is life. It's meant to bring us to Romans 8, 20 through 25. Thus Romans 7 is about the already and not yet reality of people in relation to sin. In all the book of Romans, more ink has been spilled over the identification of the person in verses 7 to 25, which we will talk more about next week. Is it Adam, whose experience appears to be closely mirrored? Is it Jews, who have the law, but are largely without regeneration? Or is it Paul? If it is Paul, then is it Paul when he was unconverted? Or was it Paul after he was saved? The answers to these questions were as varied and numerous as I had commentaries. So I fully expect that among the Bible students hearing these messages, there there might be discussion, debate. I hope not division. And without mm, developing the merits or the problems with each view, I want to propose something for you to think about, and then as we work through the text, as we get there, to think about, could this be? I want to propose that Paul has left it ambiguous on purpose. That the reason we struggle with, is it this or that or this or that, is because Paul left it that way. He left it open to, so what do you think? I believe it's an autobiographical. And yet, at some level, it's intended to be universal. He has chosen to relate his own struggle because... This is precisely the struggle we face as well. And further, since Romans 7 is coming out of Romans 6 and is preparing us to take us into Romans 8, that I'm intentionally reading some of Romans 8 back into 7. I assume that what he wrote in Romans 7, Paul knew where he was going. He did not sit down one day, write Romans 7, without any sense of what's next. And you can't preach Romans 7 without knowing what's next. I was once on vacation sitting in a church with my wife, and I'm listening to the preacher, 
dawns on me about halfway through the text, there is no way he's read the next paragraph. I mean, he distinctly preached himself into a corner because he, he had his pericope, he had his paragraph, his actually three paragraphs, and he's preaching away and he's going through. <laughs> Except the next, I wondered what he did the next Sunday. I kind of wanted to go back just to see what he was going to do. Um, and so sometimes when we think about a text and we know where an author is going, it's really good to think about, is he laying foundations? Is he making allusions? And we've already seen him do that in Romans 6. Thus what is going on in Romans 7 is simply the already not yet tension that a Christian lives in all the time. Not only relating to his eschatology, but also relating to his transformation. I have been decisively delivered from the power of sin... And I will be fully and finally delivered from the presence of sin, but not yet. And I live in that tension. And that makes the struggle in Romans 7 what it is. And the hope-giving walk in and with the Spirit in Romans 8. What we all aim for, what we all pursue after, and what we all hope for. Now, we open this chapter with Paul showing us our freedom from the law. Verses 1 to 6. And, and I know, I, 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 you know, I, I almost could bring Tim Nixon's one-string banjo up here because it does seem like we've been talking about this subject a lot in a lot of different contexts. From Bible education to here to... Now... Just to explain, the law is treated as a sphere of authority. And Paul unpacks how we are delivered from it. He is answering the questions that might be raised in response to Romans 6.14, where we are said not to be under law, but under grace. If that is so, then what does it mean? And so Paul begins with its concerned interrogative in verse 1. He's asking a question. Or do you not know, brothers? Now, you know, it's interesting when a chapter starts with something obviously connecting it to what went before. Or do you not know, brothers, for I'm speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. So we're not under law, but we are under grace. And therefore, there's a freedom that comes with it, a freedom not to be enslaved to the old, but rather to present ourselves so that we are enslaved to the new. So, Paul says, let me unpack this for you. So he asks this question. And notice first its intended audience. And Paul is addressing two groups in the church. He expects all the brothers, that is all Christians, to hear what he's saying. This is the large circle that includes us now as Gentile Christians. But inside the large circle are believers who know the law. And these are first Jews, maybe Gentile proselytes to Judaism who have now become saved. Or just Gentiles who have been taught the law at some point in their lives. And finally, there's a small circle of those with whom this is meant to be sarcastic. Do you not know, brothers? For I am speaking to those who know the law. These are the law men, the Judaizers, those who are wrongly teaching the law in the church. So what was going on in Galatia and all the churches across Galatia was a struggle in Rome. It was a struggle in so many churches because they were going along behind Paul and trying to take Christians and teach them a super spirituality that would come as a result of being under the of, of going back to the law, particularly in circumcision. 
But there is an important principle. And Paul poses a question based on an obvious principle. Law only has jurisdiction over a person when they are alive. This would have been true in both Jewish and Roman law as it is ours. When you're dead, they can't give you a speeding ticket. I know the dead can vote. That's, that's another issue. But. So a person who has died is beyond the reach of the law. Their death moves them out of the sphere of its authority. So if this represents that sphere in which law has jurisdiction then a person who has died is no longer in this sphere and no longer under its jurisdiction. I've illustrated this in our modern world by speeding laws here in America and in Germany. And so the German law has no jurisdiction over me here, which is, a, you know, I usually think of it the other way around, right? The 55 and 65 mile an hour speed limits here don't have any jurisdiction over me in Germany on the autobahns. Woo! -hoo. And so a death moves a person out from its sphere of authority. The law has no longer any jurisdiction over that dead person. And for the rest of the chapter, this fundamental principle is critical. Too much mishandling of text happens because this principle and its illustration in verses 2 or 3 is not carried through the text. So remember this. The law is a sphere of authority. Those in the sphere of authority are under that law. Got it? Okay. Secondly, the law is no longer binding on those who have died. We all agree with that, right? We all understand that. We all got that. So that's Paul's question. Don't you understand? And when someone has died, they're no longer under the jurisdiction of law. They're not bound to the law. And he says, now let me illustrate it. Verses 2 and 3. He uses, Paul uses an illustration based on the laws of marriage in his day. Uh, but it does still require some close attention to what Paul actually say, says. This is one of those texts that you've got to really read it carefully or it'll be easy to hear something different than what Paul's actually saying. And listen to what he writes. Verse 2, Thus a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, he is free from that law. She marries another man, then she's not an adulteress. Now the first off, don't make Paul addressing a subject he isn't. He's not addressing the subject of when is a person free to remarry. If you try to make this text do that, as many people do, then, then you're taking the text which has one purpose and you're trying to make it serve another purpose. And in my view, and in the view of the elders here, you're serving a purpose that isn't what the New Testament actually teaches. So there is a principle in marriage. To make this clear, think about the authority of law to bind a marriage. And this is a carefully ca crafted illustration. Notice that the woman is freed from the binding effect of the law, not because of her own death, but because of the death of another, her husband. Oh, you can already see it coming, can't you? A married woman is bound to her husband as long as he lives. But if he dies, she is released and is free to remarry even if there were no divorce. Now what are the implications then? 
And while they are married and bound under the law, any living with another man is adultery. If the man is alive and they are married, the law binds them together. To live with someone else while the man is alive is adultery because the law is in force. The law is binding the marriage. If the man dies, she is no longer bound by the marriage. Why? Well, because the law is not binding on her husband who has died. And more importantly for Paul's argument, since the husband has died, she is no longer bound to the marriage. She is free. And she is free to marry another. Now just a reminder, some have concluded from this that any remarriage is adultery unless the former spouse dies. I don't think this is what Paul has in mind. And to do that, I won't take the time to show how that does, but to do that would destroy his illustration and make it nonsense. Paul has carefully chosen this illustration because it is so close to the underlying spiritual reality. In verse 4 then are its careful implications. Paul draws these implications that will then become instructions. Look at what he does in verse 4. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. Now, first notice the comparison connections. Paul in verse 4 makes the connections between the illustration, the implications that he's going to draw upon the death of another, namely the Lord Jesus Christ. We have been released from the authority sphere of the law. The law no longer binds us. The law in one sense still exists. But we are no longer in the sphere where it has authority. We are no longer under its jurisdiction. How is that? Because we have died to the law. How did we die to the law? When we were placed into Christ. His death has become ours. His reality has become ours. When we were joined to Christ, we went through the death of the cross. Therefore, we are no longer bound to the law, nor are we bound under the law. We are free. We have died to this realm in which the law has jurisdiction because we have been joined to Christ, and in being joined to Christ, we have died. We are separated from, and we are separated to, therefore the word sanctification, and now we are in this realm and that realm no longer has jurisdiction over us. And because of the death and the resurrection of Christ, we are now freed to be married to another. In which we are in the betrothal period now. I love the way sometimes these sometimes very simple illustrations then knit together with other themes and topics and pictures in the Bible to create this very complex montage for us. Now notice... Um, so when we... Th therefore we are no longer bound to the law... Nor are we bound under the law. We have been set free. But notice <clears throat> the underlying spiritual realities. Why is that? Well, what is the result now? Well, being freed from that which bound us to the law and bound us to the old person we were, a la Romans 6, so that we might be married to another and become the new person that we are. Who are we now bound to? Well, we're bound to Christ, who has been raised from the dead. Now, why, of all the things to say about Jesus, why mention his resurrection? Well, the resurrection is mentioned here because we are now in the realm 
of life. We are bound to the one who has been raised from the dead. We are in that realm, in the Spirit, in Christ. So that we are under a new jurisdiction. And what is that jurisdiction? We saw at the end of Romans 6. We are under the jurisdiction of our new master, the Lord Jesus. We are now bound to him. And since we are bound to him, we are now under grace. Under the grace of life. What are the consequences? Well, we see it's fruitful results. This is done so that we may be united to Christ and may bring forth all that union is intended to bring forth. Here it's described as fruit. We are released from the authority of the law so that we might be united to Christ. And this aligns with so much of the New Testament where the flesh produces works that lead to death. But Christ and the Spirit produces fruit which marks and characterizes eternal life. And so this fruit is produced by life, not law. We are joined to the resurrected Christ. We have the life of God in us through the new birth, through our regeneration, through our resurrection from the dead. All those phrases, words, theological terms all refer to that instant in which the Holy Spirit and the Word of God comes into our souls and causes us to become alive. Alive unto God. And we're joined with Christ and joined to Him. All that we could do under the law was to do works. And the works of the flesh cannot and do not produce the righteous life that God requires. But having died to that old realm in, in the Spirit, uh, we are alive in the Spirit and are producing the fruit that God approves. Now, I, I recognize as I read back through this whole series, thinking, trying to orient, make sure that everything's sort of coming together, I realize this is very repetitious. You, you know, you, you could go come on two Sundays ago and heard basically the same thing just from different verses. Well, that's because that's what Paul is doing. Because Paul is very concerned that the death and resurrection, that is the gospel, is being understood not merely as the way that we are saved, but the gospel, the good news of the death and resurrection of Christ is not only saving us, but it is how we are going to be transformed. And that's why the title of this series is called Living the Gospel Life. That's what Paul is concerned. So having died to that old realm, and having been now joined to Christ, we are alive in the Spirit and are producing the fruit that God approves. Now, having helped us to understand and see the connection between the principle, a person who has died is no longer in the jurisdiction of the law, and the illustration, a lady who is married to her husband, when he dies, she is set free to be married to another. And then our reality, we have in Christ, we have died to the old jurisdiction, we are alive to our new jurisdiction, that is the Master, the Lord Jesus. Paul now goes into a deeper explanation of what all this means. And you go, wait, aren't we deep enough? <laughs> How much deeper we have to go? Well, look what he does in verses 5 and 6. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. Wait. What did he just say? While we were living in the flesh, the law aroused our sinful passions. Now what he just said? <gasps> because if you and I had just been asked what is it that arouses our sinful passions? We would have said temptation in some way. But that's where we would have gone. 
And like he, and just as he has done in Romans 5 and turning some things on its head in Romans 6, he does not answer the questions in regards to um, license and law and things like that and whether we can continue in sin. He doesn't answer those questions at all like we tend to answer it. He answers it in a completely new way, completely different way. So our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve not under the old written code, but in the new life of the Spirit. The summary of the argument is laid out in verses 5 and 6. Notice how each phrase corresponds to Romans 6 through 8. It's an oversight on my part. I meant to put this grid in there. So when Paul says, <laughs> little tiny writing, get bigger, thank you. And still a little tiny writing. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. That's Romans 6, isn't it? While we were in the flesh, our sinful passions were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. That's what Romans 6 was all about. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve not under the old written code, there's Romans 7, but in the new life of the Spirit, there's Romans 8. So the outline, if you will, the topical outline for Romans 6, 7, and 8 is in these two, is in these two verses. So now let's look at what he's doing with this then. First, notice our past as sinners in verse 5. And notice the elements of what it meant to be a sinner. And these are drawn from Romans 1 to 3. You can trace every single one of these back to something somewhere in Romans 1 to 3. First, there's the sphere in which we lived called the flesh. All of us, all of you, were born and lived in that realm subject to its power, and under the jurisdiction of the law. Paul calls it the flesh. Now, he's not talking merely about our bodies, though our bodies are a part of this realm, this world, in all its fallenness. And while our bodies in and of themselves are not sinful or corrupt, we're not Gnostics, they are still a part of this realm. They have to go down into the grave and die or be immediately transformed a la 1 Corinthians 15, right? And so this seed, this body goes down into the ground and on the resurrection day it comes out in a glorified body and the new glorified body stands to the old body as a beautiful flower stands to the little small seed from which it sprung. Different, but of the same kind. But the flesh then, in much of Paul's writing, refers to fallenness, refers to depravity. But in Paul's mind, it is an in. It's a place we can, we can be in. And so, when we talk about being in the flesh, and, and Paul will be careful, because when he's talking about the body, and he wants to know if someone was in the body or out of the body, remember when he does that? He doesn't use the word sarcos. He actually uses the word body. And so it's different from the word translated flesh. And so, in our past as sinners, we lived in this sphere that Paul refers to as the flesh. The impetus then for most of our sin was our sinful passions. Our lusts, our cravings and desires 
are the powerful impetus for sinning. While we were sinners, we lived in the flesh, and we were driven by our passions, by our lusts, by our cravings. The entity that provoked our passions was the law. <laughs> now, you, you have to stop and listen to what Paul says here. You know, there are times where I would have loved to have been, you know, the keyboardist at the church at Rome and look out over the Jew and Gentile and watch as this is being read to them and watch the look on Jewish faces. He goes, what? What did he just say? Temptations are all involved in our sinning ways. Paul says something shocking. The law which was designed to show sin and to restrain sin and to provide for the atonement of sin, that is the covering of sin until Jesus came, actually stirred up the flesh and its passions. Okay, now wait a minute, Paul. You've got to explain that next week. Because it's in the rest of the chapter. In essence, the rest of what Paul does this takes that little phrase and says, now let's see how this phrase works. Let's see what it does. So we lived in the sphere of the flesh. Our sinful passions drove us most of our sin. The entity that provoked our passions, the law. And the means by which we sinned, our members. Our physical body. And so our passions, then stirred up by the law, then drove us to sinning with our body. Maybe in our thoughts. It's still in our body. Maybe with our hands. It may be with our mouth. Maybe with our ears. Feet and so on. And so the means by which we sin is our physical body. You hear this amazing description in just a few words of what our past was as sinners. The result... Um, so doing this is called... Doing sin is called works. Which is really interesting. Because then you take Paul's theology of works. Plural. And you study that through the New Testament and you come away going, that's very different than what I think of as works. Paul says works were the result of living in the flesh, driven by your sinful passion, stirred up by the law, so that you did stuff in your body that are called works. The result of this dynamic in our life, death tainted fruit. Now, what's he alluding to? When he says, fruit unto death, what should come to mind? The garden. Genesis. Here is death-tainted fruit. Eat of it, and you will die. So all of this intertwined in complex ways through every faculty of who and what we are were so as to produce fruit that heads towards death. It is evidence that we are in Adam. But then in verse 6, is our privilege as saints, in contrast to all the complex mess of flesh and passions and sin and law and works, we have the utter simplicity of the Christian life. We are released from the law. We are no longer under the jurisdiction of the law. We have died to the old. We are no longer alive spiritually in that realm. We are no longer captives. Paul sees this as a realm that enslaved us, that chained us, that captured us, in which we were unable to free ourselves. But we have been set free so that we're no longer held captive by all that I just described in this realm. 
We serve now in a different way. Now is a voluntary servitude to our loving Lord, as he said at the end of 6. And we have new life. We have a new inward power that animates us and thus gives us a new way of living. And what is that new life? We have the life of the Spirit. Our new life is animated by the Spirit who produces through us our fruit unto God. So our release from the law is a redemptive historical reality that then impacts us personally and individually. We live on this side of Jesus' death and resurrection, right? And if you're converted, you also live on this side of the cross in your own life. I get this from the language itself. While we were, but now we are. <laughs> Bless God for the but now we are. Now that Christ has come having died on the cross and having been raised from the dead, the new era of life in the Spirit has begun. The law as an authoritative sphere came to an end at the cross and further we are under law while we are in the flesh until we are saved. Now that we have been saved, we are now under grace. And once again, there is the historical aspect before and after the cross and the personal aspect before and after conversion. And this perspective prepares us to expect an inaugurated, an incomplete experience of its reality. The rest of 7 unpacks verse 5. To show how our sinful passions aroused by law worked in our bodies so as to bring about fruit characterized by death. And what follows is designed in such a way not to leave us hopeless and helpless at the end of Romans 7, but to prepare us for the glorious hope set forth in Romans 8. Who shall deliver us from the body of this death? Thanks be to God, Jesus Christ our Lord. Let me close by simply bringing together the scriptures that we have taught and some other verses from Romans 6 through 8. I'd like to reread 7, chapter 7, verses 1 through 6 from the New Living Translation. They translate it this way. Now, dear brothers and sisters, you who are familiar with the law, don't you know the law applies only while a person is living? For example, when a woman marries, the law binds her to her husband as long as he is alive. But if he dies, the laws of marriage no longer apply to her. While her husband is alive, she would be committing adultery if she married another man. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law and does not commit adultery when she remarries. So, my dear brothers and sisters, this is the point. You died to the power or the authority of the law when you died with Christ. And now you are united with the one who was raised from the dead. As a result, we can produce a harvest of good deeds for God. When we were controlled by our old nature, sinful desires were at work within us. The law aroused these evil desires that produced a harvest of sinful deeds, which would result in death. But now... We have been released from the law, for we died to it and we are no longer held captive to its power. Now we can serve God, not in the old way of obeying the letter of the law, but in the new way of living in the Spirit. Praise God. Now listen then to these core texts from Romans 6, 7, and 8. Going back to Romans 6, 11 and through 14. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. You've got to uh, believe this in a way and apply it to yourself. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will not have dominion over you since you are not under law, 
but under grace. And again, verses 5 and 6 of Romans 7. For while we were living in the, in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. Now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive or bound us to it, so that we might not serve under the old written code, but in the new life of the Spirit, so that we are freed to be married to another. Ah, oh, but Romans 8, which we haven't gotten to yet. Verses 22, 25. Here's the present reality. The whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, that is, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved. Now, hope that is seen isn't hope. Who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not yet see, oh, we wait for it with patience. Not license, not law, but life by the Spirit. Begun in the now, but groaning and struggling and suffering until the day that Jesus comes. Piercing, powerful, productive, faith in what the Lord has done for us in the gospel. This, brothers and sisters, is what it means to live the gospel life. Let's pray. Father, um, help us to believe what you are telling us. We can't see it. In some senses, we can't feel it. It, it, it's largely in the spiritual realm, and yet it is true. In fact, it's truer than sometimes the delusion, deceits, and falseness of the physical realm in which we live. I pray somehow, by your grace, for your glory, help that light to go on. And people have that moment of saying, Oh, I see it. And now... We begin to explore its depths so that we can understand it and be transformed by it. And we ask all this, not that we might just be good, but that you might be glorified.